Excellent. So, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Martin. Uh, on behalf of the World Economic Forum and also CNBC, welcome to our little panel here. Uh, it's nice to see that uh, we're able to break down or break up into smaller groups like this because, uh, well, it, it, it can be a little bit more casual, more uh, informal, a little bit more intimate. And it might help because we're talking about what potentially can be a, a pretty heavy topic which is uh, biometrics. Uh, could potentially be revolutionary, lead to a heck of a lot of uh, positive changes with uh, digital ideas. At the same time, though, there is a risk, potentially, if misused, if mismanaged, if abused, well, then we could potentially have things like human rights, civil rights, uh, and certainly privacy problems uh, as well. Uh, so these are issues that we'll talk about along with, of course, the latest in, in technology with our panel of experts. Let me very quickly uh, run through them in uh, no particular order. Right next to me, uh, Bob Livingston, Senior VP of Strategic Projects at Visa. Uh, next to him, uh, Rob Leslie from Sedici uh, Innovations. Next to him, uh, Dr. Rita Singh, who's from Carnegie Mellon, an associate research professor there. And last but not least, right at the very end, David Brady, who heads uh, Acuity. Acuity. Acuity, right. Acuity, thank you, uh, which is a Chinese-American smart camera uh, maker. So, folks, we've got about uh, 45 minutes or so to, to spend with you, a little bit shorter than a lot of other sessions I've done uh, at WEF. And what we'll do is uh, we'll kick it off and uh, talk among ourselves. And then at some stage, uh, we'll open it up to the floor and, and involve and, and bring you folks in. Uh, and just a point of housekeeping, uh, this is being taped and recorded and I think uh, will be shot out over the web. So if you do have a communications device, Probably a good idea to either turn it off or if you really have to stay connected to, to turn it on silent just for the duration of this, uh, of our session here. And, uh, you know, we've got these simultaneous translation jobbies if you so uh, wish to use them or, or need to use them. So we encourage you to, uh, to do that. So l let me kick off. I want to start talking about the technology itself, if I could. And uh, quick show of hands. Uh, to the right when you get to the top of the escalator, you turn right and there's this uh, voice recognition demonstrator. How many of you have tried that? That's it. Oh, okay, not bad. All right, yeah. I, I've noticed the last couple of days that the lines have been really, really long. So I thought, okay, this must be really popular. I got to uh, check this out and try it for myself. So I did. And um, the lady just in front of me uh, tried it out and uh, she read a sample of prepared text. Uh, it, which got recorded, and uh, I was pretty surprised initially because it accurately predicted uh, her gender, okay, maybe not that hard, uh, her ethnicity, she was Caucasian, uh, her age range, so I thought, okay, well, this is pretty good stuff. And then it went on, though, to tell the entire line of people waiting behind her that uh, she had serious neurological issues, and that she was mentally exhausted as well, at which point I think the rest of the line just sort of turned around and went the other way. <laughs> so, uh, no, let's, uh, uh, a funny example, but I guess it, it speaks to the, the limitations of the technology right now. Uh, maybe I could just sort of run down the road, or whoever prefers to answer. At this stage, uh, we're pretty much well beyond fingerprints. Retina. We're getting into DNA biometrics, uh, voice recognition as well. And Dr. Dr. Singh had talked to us about that. Um, what what is what is the cutting edge right now in biometric technology? Anybody? I think there's a lot of uh, development work going on uh, around facial recognition, um, specifically the use cases. Uh, you know, payments uh, would be one. Uh, I'm, I'm involved in the, the forums initiative for the future of travel, so the, the modernization of airports, uh, trying to get people through queues in, in airports, at, at borders, at security, so that you can move faster through those, those choke points. Um, and again, trying to identify you as accurately and as quickly as possible um, is, is one of the key objectives. Uh, okay, so uh, understood, and uh, gosh, I tell you, uh, if you fly a lot, uh, you would probably want to see that technology uh, work faster or better, more efficient. But what kind of technology is it right now? 
I could I could take a swing of that. I mean, sure. the, the number one thing, like some of the technology Dr. Singh is using around uh, neural networks, neural networks are blind to the actual modality. So the the, the major innovation has been that uh, it's possible to combine multiple modes: visual, voice, uh, gait, um, many things together, and they can be combined in an integrated way. So. Usually the identification would be done in context. So before saying somebody was mentally ill, you might guess whether they're in a hospital or not. <laughs> but, but by the ability to combine in context a lot of different markers together would make biometrics extremely accurate. How advanced is DNA biometrics right now? I know. Well, DNA, you have, you have to go to a lab. It would be, they would be extremely accurate, but it would take a day or so. Yeah. That's right. There are biometrics such as blood flow biometrics that are also fairly accurate. And so at Visa, we've got a prototype where you swipe your hand through a reader and it just measures the blood flow and that identifies who you are. We also have payment rings that are uh, near field communication devices that can pay at any sort of contactless point of sale. And so you can imagine a future where you've got a ring measuring your blood flow and nobody else can ever use it. It's yours. How extensively used is it and in where right now? Well, right now it's just in prototype mode, but you asked ah. about cutting edge and so that's where it is. Okay, fair enough. It's in beta. And I mean, your space, uh, Bob, uh, payments, financial services, et cetera, that's been the industry that's been driving a lot of the development and change uh, in biometrics. But is it likely to, to stay that way? Other industries that could, that could take the ball and run with it, do you think? Well, I think payments is a very logical place for biometrics to start. It's an industry that really values security and also values convenience. And biometrics actually provides both of those in a very good way that consumers understand. Here in China, for example, we've got the most advanced market in the world where biometrics are used every single day when consumers are using their mobile payment devices. And with WeChat or Alipay or the other uh, platforms identifying themselves at the point of sale with their thumbprint. But uh, to your question about where could it be used elsewhere, mm. this is really where biometrics, I think, converges with the Internet of Things, and where you can have any sort of device, any sort of object with a biometric reader, with a fingerprint reader, that then becomes a point of commerce mm. at the same time. We've, again, prototypes. We've got people who've got plastic cards with fingerprint readers on them. Mm -hmm. And so that's a traditional form factor. But you can imagine a situation where vending machines would have fingerprint readers. And then the real questions of privacy come into play. Where is the data stored? When is it centralized? When is it decentralized? When do you have actual payment and identity credentials on the actual device? Mm -hmm. Or when do you have something that's masked or, or tokenized mm -hmm. so that it can't be stolen? So, a uh, key question, I don't mean to get the backup of, uh, of our hosts here in China, but uh, what you're talking about is a massive uh, database uh, in China. How secure is that? Who has access to it? Well, uh, I think that's a question better posed to Ant Financial or to Tencent, which run uh, Alipay and WeChat Pay. Uh, but as of right now, it has been fairly secure as a payment vehicle. Okay. Where that data exists beyond the actual process of payments, I can't say. Uh, Rita, let me bring you in. Uh, the, the voice recognition demonstrator I was just joking about a couple of minutes ago, that, that, that's actually, uh, you're behind that. Yes. Uh, is the issue here that uh, this is AI driven, right? So the more voice samples it has or collects, the more accurate it can be. But was that the issue with the whole, you know, neurological disorders and mental exhaustion thing? Okay, so I am... <laughs> May Maybe I, it was right, I don't know. But. <laughs> okay, um, may I correct you on one uh, point? Yeah. Uh, it, is, uh, it is AI driven, but it is not data driven entirely. Okay. So AI is being used to engineer the features that are then mapped to the parameters that we deduce from voice. So much of, the, much of the mapping and the accuracy of it depends on how well we are able to do the engineering to discover these micro features oh. from voice. So uh, the way people perceive AI now is just big data, throw big data at neural networks and that's AI, that's mm -hmm. not it. Mm -hmm. AI is, neural networks are just, just tools, but AI is really more than that. It's what you design with those tools, right? So much of the profiling, the technology that, that is being uh, demonstrated next door, is called profiling humans from their voice. And it's all about deducing all kinds of information about you from your voice, mm. for which there are signatures in your voice, whether you're able to hear them or not. Mm -hmm. It's going to take a while to develop that to a point where it's completely accurate. And what you see there is a snapshot of where the research is right now. But it is really scary to think 
that your voice can really reveal so much Which leads about me. your voice, <clears throat> uh, about, about your, yourself, your no, persona, and course. also your environment. Mm -hmm. So um, there are issues associated with that, yeah. ethical issues. Yeah. Um, but more than that, I've been, um, I mean, I also have something to say about biometrics and the way we think about it, not just the voice profiling. Um, so we always, so we're talking about facial recognition, we are talking about other kinds of biometrics, fingerprint recognition. Mm -hmm. Behind all of that are algorithms that have been deployed, and those algorithms have shortcomings. Right, and there are, and as an academic, I'm aware that there are, there are my colleagues and many groups of researchers around the world who are working on building adversarial systems that can attack these algorithms oh. and cause them to give wrong results. Mm -hmm. Whether, <clears throat> even, even if they don't have access to the innards of the system, mm -hmm. even if they don't have access to the algorithms themselves. They can actually break into Google's speech recognizer, and the examples are up on the web. This is um, a group in Berkeley that has done this. Could, can break into the Google speech recognizer and make it say exactly what they want it to say. So at least to this question, the existing technology that's being deployed today, yeah. how secure or rather how, how hackable is, the is it? Hackable is it in itself? Mm -hmm. That's an issue, <clears throat> right? Its accuracy is an issue, but there are two sides of a coin. Right. right. And we have to worry about that. And there are other issues involved, like ethical issues, which mm -hmm. everyone is questioning yeah. and everyone is aware of. Okay. Well. <clears throat> so the so, short answer to my question, I mean, how fragile or secure are these systems to hacking uh, these days? I mean, what's being used, is it safe yet? No. No. No, no, no. Facial, okay. uh, facial recognition systems can be hacked. If you go on to Google and search for papers that are coming up with newer and newer algorithms to hack facial, deployed facial recognition systems, you will find very good algorithms up there. So David, that's yeah. your space. You make smart cameras, right? And she's saying, look, these images, digital images, can be hacked, true? Oh, definitely they could be hacked. I mean, it's an information system. But when you say how safe are they, they're, they're safer. Um, so as somebody, I live half time in China, half time in the U.S. I've gotten four new credit cards in the U.S. in the last year because my credit card was stolen. I use Alipay and WeChat all the time, and I'm, I feel very secure there. Mm. So these things can be hacked, <coughs> but they're harder to hack than stealing somebody's credit card number. Okay, good to know. Um, let's bring in uh, 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 Sadishi. Right, Gaelic name. I thought it was Italian. What you do is what your company does is you uh, you build platforms that help people build their own digital identity. Explain how that works. So your identity is everywhere, and most of the places it is, you have no control over the information that's there, and most of the time you don't even know if it's right or wrong. So we're building a platform that allows you to build a profile of, of yourself, where your information resides and whether it is right or wrong based on what you say is your version of the truth. And we do that using a cryptographic protocol that doesn't require any exchange of the actual data itself. So your privacy is preserved at all <coughs> times. So our interest in, in biometrics, because it's such a key piece of, of you, um, is making sure that that information stays where it needs to stay and doesn't end up leaking so, or being sent to, to other places. So it's safe is what you're saying, but is it necessarily accurate if a person can build whatever digital identity they want for themselves? Well, this leads me on to what, what we're working on is, is a picture of the world where you have what we call levels of assurance. So where your information is stored and who is in control of it and how reliable that place actually is. So take your passport today as an example. We don't own our passports. Our, our passports are loaned to us by our governments. And they are the custodians of our information. They are the custodian of our facial biometric that is used to grant us permission when we cross a border. And it's a government-to-government -government relationship that says, we keep this secure, and in return, you allow our citizens to cross your border and do whatever they need to do. Mm. When we start to think about how we're using technology today and how biometric information is being placed in our phones, for example, 
we have you know, a copy of our passport, for example, in our, in our phone, and ultimately we want to get to a world where um, we can use our, our phone as our passport to allow us to do certain things, we need to make sure that the security of that device is at least as robust as the security of our physical paper passport, mm. and that the government can warrant that that data is secure. Now, today, we're not at that point. The latest phones, the smartphones that we have, have technology in them that allows those what we call secure elements, trusted execution environments, uh, to hold this information and allow, under secure circumstances, the in interaction that needs to happen between devices in an airport in your phone or devices in your bank in your phone or wherever, um, so that that information always main is maintained in a secure state. So, Robert, I've got to ask you, I mean, who, who, it's safe, okay, that's, that's good, but who authenticates the accuracy, the veracity of the data, of the identity? Who's to say that you are you? Well, ultimately, it's the government is is warranting to another government, in the case of a passport, that you are you. Um, and that is generally because you've gone to a government office, you've looked an official in the eye, and they've said, yep, you are the person who is in that passport, you are, you know, female, 45 years old, whatever, whatever it is, and that information now gets inscribed in that document with a whole bunch of passive security measures that stop counterfeiting of that document. We've got to essentially do the same thing for electronic devices. And we're not quite at that point yet. Um, we're getting there, um, but we've, we've got a bit of a, a job to do still. Can digital identities be, be forged? I mean, physical passports, people have been forging them for, yes. since passports were invented, right? But digital identity yes. on your platform? No, not on our platform. Um, um, definitely not on our platform. Um, because we don't have any data on our platform. Data resides in other places, and all we do is compare what you have with what you have, okay. or what she has with what he has. And it's cryptographically And it's cryptographically secure. safe. Yeah. Robert? Right. I was going to say, in, in the payment space, in the rest of the world, Visa partners with Apple Pay, Samsung Pay, Android Pay, and in all those cases, the data on the device is tokenized. So it actually doesn't reflect what's said printed on your card, mm -hmm. nor can it be used on any other device. It's unique for that one yes. device. So in this example, if you had passport information on your phone, it actually would be a sort of masked or, or a tokenized version of your passport, and then it actually couldn't be used when you need to replace it, or it could be used to, to spoof in another location. Okay, I, I got to raise the, this question because we've been talking about it uh, this week as well. Um, blockchain technology, distributed ledger technology. It's, it's a buzzword, it's fashionable. Everybody likes to claim that yes, we, uh, uh, we're going down that road. Does it have a place and how important a place uh, in the de development, further development of biometrics? Definitely. Definitely. Blockchain technology is the most advanced authentication technology that we have. Mm. And, uh, of course, you're going to use it as a part of a solution for uh, maintaining security. That It makes it much harder to spoof because you'd have to spoof everywhere. Okay. I'm going to take a completely opposite view Please. on this. Please, Because yes. I, I am concerned about privacy generally, um, that you know, our, our personal information slowly is being... Uh, eroded um, and or sold the, or well the, the <laughs> thought of my information my biometric information being enshrined in a blockchain forever terrifies me um, I don't want it in a blockchain and mm. when you know I'm, I'm European um, in Europe uh, most people will have heard of GDPR the general data protection regulation yeah. um, one of the rights you have under that is to request erasure of your your information on demand if I put personal information into a blockchain, it can't be erased unless the chain itself is deleted, um, which, is, which I, is a real challenge. I would agree with you. Uh, blockchains are immutable, but they're not private. You can actually, they have to be mined. In, in the case of uh, cryptocurrency, for example, or bitcoins or whatever, miners have to have access to information in order to authenticate mm. a transaction and add it to the blockchain, right? So once someone has access to that information, it's not, it's not cryptographically uh, hidden from anyone. Mm. It's, it's, it's accessible. 
The only thing blockchain guarantees is that you cannot change anything in that chain once it has been added to it. Mm. So, and there are negative implications to that. <clears throat> Commercially or economically, I mean, blockchain is actually extremely expensive to, to execute. If it were used to develop biometrics further, will that hold it back? Will, that, will it hold development back? Anybody? I think you're going to see blockchains developed um, in, in instances where they're, they're not as sensitive per se um, when it comes to sort of personal, very personal information. I mean, biometrics is the most personal information you can get. Mm. And I think they will be held in secure, very secure databases generally, in, in probably centralized uh, locations. And they will link um, through APIs uh, under secure circumstances to maybe to a blockchain that has a pseudonym of you um, that links to a supply chain or, or a payment um, mechanism or whatever it is. Okay. But that pseudonym um, is what ultimately will be the linkage back to that biometric information. Okay, so we've talked about different technologies. We're starting to get into issues like privacy, et cetera. Uh, I want to get to a sort of a big macro question, something that we've been uh, covering and also talking about pretty much all week long, and that's how this whole uh, trade situation has kind of escalated and, and started blowing up. Uh, Tuesday morning, president decides 200 billion, we're going to tariff that, 25%, well, 10 and then 25 uh, uh, starting next January. China retaliates 60, but they're going 5 and 10, so tiered and maybe not as bad as people expected. But over and above and beyond that, trade, tariffs, et cetera, there's this whole uh, competition, uh, rivalry uh, 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 between structures, uh, between systems of government, and also over competition over who's going to dominate technologies of the future behind things like the fourth industrial revolution, including AI, robotics, et cetera. David, I want to get you in on this because we were talking about this offline a couple of seconds ago. Does biometrics fit uh, in there, in this competition, uh, in this rivalry, uh, and, and you know, you're, you make smart cameras, but you are a Chinese American company, so in a sense, it, it's kind of win win for you, for you, no? Well, tension between the United States and, and China is not win win for us. Um, the, the, we would uh, we would like to see the United States and China get along, and we're, we're talking about business. You know, the business shouldn't be so confrontational. Um, the development of, of these technologies is, is for the net uh, benefit of the world. Um, so I, I think that it's not competition. That, that advances in China, advances in the U.S. benefit uh, both countries. But it's not. The regulation is very different in, in the different countries. And so as we as we as technologists or others imagine the I ideal world, um, I think like like for the government to pass the government in Europe to pass a law saying you have the right to be erased, even if that's not technically possible, governments are coming up with ideas that are not consistent with uh, technological uh, reality left and right. And the idea that the US or China or Russia can control AI or can control biometrics, that's absurd. So, so governments will come up with these kinds of restrictions. As technologists, um, we can't build these things. There, there's things in China that you need. There's things in the US that you need. If you want to build advanced technologies, you need to work globally. And so um, you know, you got to hope that the, the winds of government you know, behave at the speeds that they happen, but the underlying relationships between people have to continue to grow. All right, so what you're saying basically is this whole rivalry thing is in nobody's interest. Uh, one, and uh, uh, the approach uh, should be global. Are you also saying that it's kind of pointless trying to figure out or ask who is leading uh, in biometrics nationally, or even if, it's, even if it involves uh, the companies and where they're domiciled, whether it's the U.S. Or, or China? Well, you know, Dr. Singh talked about, you know, people can hack things at a much, much simpler level. There, there's no way that one country is going to come up with an algorithm that the other country is not going to find out about. The, basically, this stuff, you know, the information about how to do these things uh, moves literally at the speed of light. You know, that as it's invented in Shanghai, people in the west co east coast of the United States know about it three, 30 seconds later. Mm, okay. Uh, since we uh, started getting into uh, regulation already, let's uh, go down that road then. Uh, I know that uh, uh, David, yourself, and also uh, uh, Bob, you've got some pretty interesting and also strong views uh, in the sense that because the, uh, the rate and pace at which biometric technology uh, is developing, it's kind of hard for regulation 
to, to keep pace, is that right? It's, it's very hard for regulation to keep pace. There are still laws in the United States, for example, that say that you have to sign for an account, and that actually exists in China as well with a new credit card, where you need a wet signature, and that's just not how the world is operating usually today. As in an ink signature. As an ink signature, yeah, okay. right? There's a digital signature, which works just as well. Mm -hmm. But I think that there, in, to your question about rivalry, as well as this question about regulation, there actually are common sets of principles in terms of how something like biometrics can be used that almost every government is going to agree upon at a very high level in terms of if a, customer, if a consumer is using biometrics for a commercial application, they should have control over when that happens. And the World Economic Forum, as an example, with the uh, Fourth Industrial Revolution um, Committee or Council, they have this, uh, we have this ability to start to create uh, a forum for different governments and private sector and academia to talk about what should those principles and standards be. And potentially that could help defuse some of this rising tension to have a common set of understandings about when and where uh, should biometrics and, and other sort of new technologies be used. Okay, so this would be sort of like a, be, a, be a code of conduct it's almost, uh, it's almost like a code of conduct. Yeah, but, but not legally binding. No, it's voluntary. And, and from Visa's perspective, the best standards are always voluntary and uh, open so that they're used everywhere around the world. Nobody really benefits if you have a technology that you can use in China, but you can't use it in Brazil, mm -hmm. right? It means that in a global environment where people travel, you're limited in terms of the applicability of it. So that, that ability to have something open and common is, is key. Okay, whatever the, these principles are that uh, eventually end up being agreed on, what happens when uh, the issue of sovereignty kicks in? What happens if uh, China, for example, uh, which is very much in the lead, uh, as you suggested, uh, at least in, in terms of payments uh, with bi uh, biometrics, what if they don't sign on? Well, that's a risk with any sort of international agreement, but I think we won't know that until we start to have that conversation and say what are all each government trying to ensure for their population in terms of how biometrics are used at that very highest level. As soon as you get to anything be below principles, more granular than principles, mm. there will never be agreement. How close are we to that sort of um, agreement, deal, or even document? Well, one example is on the Internet of Things, which is a very amorphous term that can refer to almost anything, but is in many ways connected with biometrics. Uh, the WEF has a council that's uh, going to be established, that's going to be working on that in the next few months. And that's, uh, that's coming down the pike. Will it actually have a real impact uh, in the next six months? I would doubt it. It's too soon. But you can't actually create common language and common purpose unless you start the conversation. How much input does civil society have in this? Or is it having in this? I, well, the, uh, in the, the chart of the World Economic Forum, it's very much to have all stakeholders present. So it is government, it is uh, mm. commercial interests, and it's other representatives of civil society, yeah. whether it be um, NGOs or universities, et cetera. And is it going to address the issues of uh, issue of privacy? It must. I think it should. Yeah. I, particularly for biometrics, privacy is one of the most important issues. Right now, actually, consumers love biometrics in the payment space, right? So uh, when Visa does a survey worldwide, 86% of people say that they want to use their thumbprint or their retina in order to ensure that their identity isn't stolen and a transaction is fast. And everybody understands that. But as soon as privacy issues start to come to the fore, and they haven't yet on this front, mm -hmm. that trust will dissipate. And we don't want that selfishly as a payments company that is, uh, that's relying on this. Okay, is, on the technology itself, um, is it going to function something like the FAA to police whether uh, the technology works as advertised uh, on the box? Because, I mean, any number of examples uh, a lot of people can think of or imagine where I mean, the, uh, if, if the technology gets it wrong, the, you know, the results could be pretty embarrassing, uh, at the very least, if not catastrophic. I, I think for that specific example, mm. that's actually too granular for a multilateral organization to try to Should manage. be left to governments then? That, I think that that's something ultimately, when you're talking about consumer protection, yeah. that falls under a traditional national government's purview. David, what do you think? I think the, the, the issue is you have to have the process to re resolve issues when something goes wrong. It, so things will go wrong, and so it's really uh, getting to that level of uh, knowing, how to, uh, knowing how to fix it when it goes wrong. Mm. We talk, China uses uh, face detection and fingerprint detection at the borders. Um, recently, I, I came into China with a beard. With, with a beard, okay. Yeah, and uh -huh. you, you know, like, you're not you, and you just, 
there, there's a process to resolve, well, I could be me with a beard. And that, you know, it's not, it's not te the technology is not going to be accurate. It's going to get it wrong. So it's, it's, did, like, did it? it's like when somebody, the technology says you're mentally ill, don't immediately go to the hospital. Maybe get a second opinion. <laughs> <laughs> did the technology get it wrong with, with the beard and no beard? Yeah, they, 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 it took me, uh, you know, 20 minutes or something to talk about that I could have be the same person with a beard. And you had to convince a human being. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Okay, it might be a good time now to uh, try and bring some of you in. Anybody have a, a question? The only thing we ask is if you could uh, raise your hand. I think they've got uh, their roving mics that will come to you. So uh, tell us who you are, uh, where you're from, who you represent, and also who your question or comment is, uh, is meant for. That would be helpful. Anybody want to kick it off? Please, sir. Anytime I walk anywhere to get into China, they took all 10 of my fingerprints. Yeah. Um, you know, you go through all these different use cases. Why should I trust that as a password now that it's effectively a shared secret that other people have? And who would you like to answer that for you? Uh, anyone. Anybody? Have a crack? Have I a agree go. with you uh, completely. <laughs> and, and that is one of the problems is that you have a, a secret that is openly on view for everybody. Um, my fingerprints can be 3D printed um, and used on, on scanners. Um, and this may be one of the things that governments need to actually get together and figure out that we, for example, my, my country, Ireland, they don't have my fingerprints, they don't have my, my, my uh, uh, DNA, they don't have a whole bunch of stuff about me. China knows more about me, the US knows more about me than my own country. But maybe you know, governments need to step up and say, we're going to take control of the biometric information of our own citizens, and we're going to make it available under secure um, processes and structures to those organizations who need access to it in the form of a token that can be used for a, a specific purpose for a specific time um, and, and do something along those lines. The danger is you end up with every country taking everybody's information because they think they have to have it. Mm. I, I, I could, that, that's an interesting question with a, a lot of angles. I mean, the one hand, on the one sense, you know, your fingerprint can be, can, can be stolen, but on the other sense, like if I wear a ring, to me, that could be a little bit too close to having an embedded chip, you know, which, which wouldn't be stolen, but I, I wouldn't be comfortable with. The thing is that, first of all, you have multi-factor identification. That somebody just having your fingerprint, hopefully they'd have to have your phone. They might have to have other factors that would also indicate that they're you. And then, and then the other thing is that still stealing your fingerprint, 3D printing your fingerprint, is, is harder than stealing your credit card. And so it's a question of convenience versus, you know, balance of other ways that, that, that you could be spoofed. So I've got a question, uh, and uh, uh, Rob, you're talking about this. Uh, it sounds sort of mission impossible, right? Uh, create a mold or 3D print your digits and, you know, you're, you're home and away. Rita, though, how difficult or easy is it to, to forge a, a voice signature? Is it, is it really that much harder? It's at this time impossible ah. to replicate the nuances of the human voice at the micro levels. But um, if somebody records your voice and then replays the recording, they've got your voice. That is a real concern. Mm. So. Once they have, they have your voice, and we use our voice very freely because we are not aware of the potential um, of voice to identify us in many different ways. So we use Alexa, we use Siri, and, and uh, I'm not trying to put those uh, down. Mm. All I'm trying to say is that we use them freely, we get our answers, but we don't worry about what has happened, how we got the answers, what has happened to our voice. It's gone to some server. Has it been deleted from that server? Who mm. has access to it? Mm. And what if tomorrow um, I want to use a voice-based uh, authentication or verification system? Can I ever be certain that it will never be hacked will, by someone who has gotten hold of my voice print mm. Mm. from that server? So, 
I'm sorry? From this or YouTube from this video, room. right? Or from this room. Yeah. Um, it, you know, uh, biometrics like fingerprints are very much within your control, <coughs> and you can decide whether you want to give them out or not consciously. You can decide whether you want to give out your blood sample or DNA, but you cannot not talk. You have to talk. And people are walking around with phones that can record your voice at any time. Mm. And I'm developing this technology for profiling humans. It's like, think of it um, as what x-ray is to medicine. It can look into you, into your persona. So pretty much anyone who walks by you, hears you speak, could record you and have access to what's happening inside you and what can they do with it. Mm. It's a worrisome thing, <laughs> right? It's a um, scary thought. Anyway, yeah, Bob. And, no, go ahead. No, I, I have a lot to say. I mean, I... <laughs> <laughs> please, 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 please. So, um, yeah, a lot of people have brought this up. And as academics, there, there isn't much we can do about it. But one of the things I worry about is we keep talking about the use of biometrics, protection of uh, identity, and so on and so forth. But the people whose biometrics we are talking about are, for the most part, not aware of its potential, be it uh, your face, DNA, fingerprint, whatever. The general person out on the road doesn't know how potent it is. And, you know, I mean, how restrictive it can be, how, how, how misused it can be by people. So they give out these things freely. If they knew, I, I, if they knew about all of this, I can imagine a group of people who would just, you know, go up in arms and stand at the airport and say, "I'm not going to give out my personal data." Does there need to be fine print in this sort of technology then? I'm sorry. Does there need to be fine print in this sort of technology then, so yes, people are? Yes, there is. There, and I mean, that fine print has to come in the form of awareness. Mm. The media and as academics ourselves have to build that awareness in in people and then use their information. Their mm. information is like their money. And if they, if they don't know that they are giving out this valuable mm -hmm. information, it's like stealing their money, right? Bob, so, does Visa do that? Uh, steal people's money? No, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> make, sure, make sure the fine print is there. <laughs> well, well, Visa's I hope you know, man. Yeah. Our banks do that, yeah. Our, yeah. Our, our client in banks. But, but where I was going as well is it's very similar to what uh, David said earlier is that it's what creates the security is a multi-factor authentication, right? It's your fingerprint, yes, which governments have, but it's also your phone and it's your geolo geolocation signal saying you are at a store where they're saying this transaction is happening. All those things come together and it makes it an incredibly li high likelihood that that is you making that transaction at that point in time. So from a, a payments standpoint, it's incredibly powerful, especially compared to any alternative. Compared to a signature on the back of a credit card, a fingerprint is a much more secure way to ensure that somebody is who they say they are. Um, but with that being said, outside of payments and security areas, et cetera, I think there's many more layers of authentication that are needed and protection of that data. But that's, uh, that's sort of a problem, if you will, for governments really to focus on to ensure their citizens that they're gathering all that information and they'll keep it safe. Okay, Rita, forgot to ask your, uh, your voice recognition demonstrated the, the technology. How, uh, based on uh, uh, the database you have of samples, how, have you been able to uh, calculate how accurate it is? It's an infancy. At, at this time, this is just four years old. It okay. is where DNA was in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. We've just scratched the surface. It's not perfect right now, but one day it will get very accurate. Mm. The, I have no doubt about that. Can you put a number on it now, though, how accurate it uh, is? High 90s, for high, most, 90s. high 90s okay. for most of the parameters, All right. All right. including your personality. Okay. And in, including the fact whether you're neuro, neurotic or not, and, you know, <laughs> it can be more. Suddenly, you can imagine that it can be more consistent than um, physicians and clinicians, um, um, especially for personality and behavior. Um, not to criticize physicians and clinicians, if you if you if you take the opinion of multiple physicians for the same individual, 
they will not exa exactly coincide. Mm. They, they will differ. Mm. So, uh, so human beings are not very consistent mm. in making that kind of judgment. So what do you do I mean, your yeah. technology? Does it have potential applications in, let's say, medical diagnostics, do you think? I One think day? so. I think machines can be very much more consistent to mm. begin with. Okay. And right. so they provide a, a good platform for the doctors to, um, to reference their opinions okay. against. Right. Uh, time for, uh, sir, in the back. Hi, I'm, I'm Risalat from Bangladesh, and I'm a global shaper uh, with the New York Hub right now. Um, so I, uh, many of you are probably familiar with Professor Yuval Noah Harari's work. Uh, he's the author of Sapiens, uh, uh, and I'm reading his current book right now. And in it, he makes the case that the merger of infotech and biotech uh, would essentially, you know, raises the possibility that humans can be hacked, right? So, uh, so if we look at the last few years of how um, basically aggregated social media data, like social data about us, has been weaponized for manipulating people, psychologically profiling people uh, in, in election situations, uh, if we take uh, what the work you're doing, Rita, with like voices, I was talking to a, a founder of biotechnology and uh, neurotechnology um, uh, organizations who are aggregating those kinds of data. And as we have more biomarkers and stuff like that in the coming decades, if you use those to kind of do the same kind of profiling, it could really have a, a, a crazy kind of dystopian future where we can be hacked, right? So mm. I just wanted to hear your perspective about that potentiality and how we can uh, form the kind of, uh, whether it's global norms and other, other uh, agreements that could protect us against uh, that kind of eventuality. Great Thanks. question. Anybody in particular you'd like to address that? I, I agree. I think we're not far away. Um, you know, all of the piece parts that you need um, are, are potentially there. Um, it comes down to an ethical question at the end of the day. Um, is this acceptable? Um, for me, it's absolutely not acceptable. And, you know, discussions on this level happen at forums like um, the, the World Economic Forum. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, if we can build consensus that this is a line we're not going to cross, you know, for the use, for example, the, the use of drones for, for targeting of somebody because I know what your facial template looks like, mm. but these are the kind of things that we absolutely should not um, allow. Who's, as, who's going to police that, though? Who should police that? Well, it's, it's global bodies like maybe the UN or, or um, you know, that, that try to build consensus. That, that okay, David, you're naughty. I, this is a really, really great question, but, but I think the answer to the question is in your question. When we talk about social norms, Hacking is this thing where, you know, traditionally, like if you have a rock and there's a plate glass window, you don't throw the rock through a plate glass window. But somehow hacking is merged as this thing where people feel like if a system can be broken, somebody's going to go break it. Yeah, mm. but, that's true. But we don't do that because we're a society that works together, that social norms develop. So somehow we need to develop a social consensus that there are ways that people behave that involve protecting each other. And at the, at the core thing is that if people can be hacked, we protect each other so that if somebody is being bullied or being harmed or being, their, their identity is being stolen, we come together as a society to protect them rather so, than just say, we're the kind of people where if somebody can break a plate glass window, they're so, going to do it. So not so much laws, but etiquette is what you're saying. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Uh, probably got time for one last question from the floor. Anybody like to have a go? Sir, please. Just a simple question. Um, the quite exciting and uh, I think for the quite exciting and uh, at the same time scary um, uh, talks. And um, I was just wondering how we can continue to lead a, a sim simple and ordinary life that we are enjoying right now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, can we wear a mask and that will be the solution or um, what else? <laughs> I mean, good question. I mean, social media, in, in, in many senses, is, is, a, is a mask, right? Do you have a cell phone? Yeah. Start by throwing it away. <laughs> right. I don't have one. <laughs> I think life is just going to go on getting more complicated. The more technology we have, the more complicated our life becomes. Uh, so we're just talking about biometrics, but there's there are lots of other technologies coming up that are changing our lives, uh, starting from smart cities to your internet of things and everything that affects your daily life. 
is in your room, in your bedroom, in your bathroom, everywhere. Um, is that going to make our life simple? Well, you'll have to change your philosophical definition of simple exactly. to, <laughs> to get there. But I don't think our lives are going to become simpler. They may, be become, easy, they may, they may, they may become easier to live. Our, what we define as quality of life may go up, but simpler, no. Things will only become more complicated. Almost inevitably, yeah. Inevitably. Right. Uh, what I'd like to do before we wrap up is uh, maybe just go all the way down the row. Uh, last thoughts that you want to leave this audience with with regards to everything we've been talking about, Bob? Well, I think just from, uh, from my perspective, the real value here in this conversation and all the conversations happening here at the Forum are trying to create those international norms, you could call the etiquettes, the pr first principles upon which all of this complexity can be managed and the potential downside can be mitigated. Okay, all right, Rob? I think it, biometrics are an incredibly powerful um, tool. Um, you know, when you think about financial inclusion, um, you know, the, there's 1.7 people, billion people on the planet that don't have a, an identity. Um, you know, creating an identity for them, using biometrics, getting them into the financial system, giving them opportunity is something that biometrics can enable. But as, as Rob said, it, it needs a structure around it so that they are used ethically and properly uh, and we don't end up with, you know, the rogue hacker suddenly selling, you know, two billion people's biometric information on the dark web. That would mm. be catastrophic. Mm. Rita? And I think, I think uh, there... We need to devise ways to regulate the use of biometrics more strictly um, and prevent misuse by societies, not just uh, uh, individuals mm. or businesses. OK, David, I last think word. I think this idea of the, the, the social norms and etiquette is, is, is critical. But the, the idea of the competition between nations feeds the idea that we take separate paths and, and maybe encourages if you get nations acting as, as rogue hackers, then, then the system becomes very, very dangerous. And so somehow we need to find a way for nations to come together instead of to push nations How apart. much do you fear that's exactly what could happen with, bio, uh, with uh, biometrics? A lot, I guess. But, 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 but on the other hand, I have hope that that won't happen, that we can, that we can come together instead. All right. Excellent. All right, folks, listen, we're just about done. Thank you for your time to our panelists and also for you for, uh, for taking part. We'll see you next year, I guess. Thank you.